Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for signing up. Obviously, massive thank you to, uh, to Steve um, and, and John for co-hosting tonight. Um, so yeah, a few words, a bit of background and a bit of a call for, for help. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the founder of the London Java community. Uh, so I'm not a developer myself. I run a tech recruitment company called RecWorks. Uh, so here at RecWorks, we've been on a mission for the last 12 years to prove that recruitment can be a force for good in the tech industry uh, beyond just getting people jobs. And that's specifically around learning, mentoring, and career development and that kind of thing. Uh, so, so what we try to do is, is create groups and, and platforms where we connect the people that want to learn with, with others that are, that are happy to share. Uh, and that can be on a group basis, like, like this evening and through, through the LJC, uh, or on a one-to-one on -on -one level. Um, so we usually do the one-to-one the -one introductions through a community called Meet a Mentor. Um, so we introduce just mentors and mentees uh, almost every day. So um, if, you're, if you're interested, then, then do let me know. Um, so as for what I want help with, uh, one of the things that we're running in the Meet a Mentor community is a, uh, an aspiring speakers group. Uh, so we've so far this year launched 34 new speakers um, in, into, into the LJC. Uh, we run uh, lightning talk events every second Friday, and we've got one this Friday, and we're short two people. Uh, so if anybody out there is open to giving a short lightning talk, 12.30 on Friday, uh, then please do let me know. Uh, you don't have to be a new speaker. Uh, you can be an experienced speaker, um, but obviously, yeah, or you could be completely new. Most of the people will be new speakers, so feel free to, um, to get involved. Um, so everything we do is all powered by revenue from recruitment. So if you're looking to hire anyone or, or you're working for, for an organization that is, uh, then please do bear RecWorks in mind. You can find me on LinkedIn or, or, or hit me up um, on, on the, the chat on here afterwards. Uh, anyway, on to tonight. Uh, so Stephen Chin is the head of developer relations at JFrog uh, and is the author of The Definitive Guide to Modern Client Development, Raspberry Pi with Java and Pro Java FX Platform. Uh, he's keynoted numerous Java conferences around the world. Uh, and when he's not traveling, he enjoys teaching kids how to do embedded and robot programming together with his teenage daughter. So Steve, over to you. Hey, thanks very much for having me. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to um, speak with the London Java community because I think the LJC has been um, one of those really strong core members of the Java community, which has supported efforts like um, Open JDK bug fixes, um, adopt Open JDK, um, kind of like helping the overall Java community to to better engage with other user groups. Um, a lot of the ideas um, for virtual conferences and things really started in London. So I'm very pleased to be able to to join um, one of the prominent Java user groups virtually, of course, because that's kind of where we are. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is a lot about JavaFX technology, which is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I've been doing JavaFX technology since before I was at Oracle, which was, I don't know, was that eight, eight years ago I joined Oracle and I was doing evangelism and developer marketing. Um, and I think t almost 10 years or more doing JavaFX technology, which um, now I can um, honestly say it is it's proper legacy technology so it's ready <laughs> so everyone who wasn't sure if java effects was gonna be ready was gonna take off it's um now, now you know because um if if you're still doing legacy technologies like swing there's a new legacy technology in town you, you should adopt java effects um and you know well let's keep this are, are do you guys have it uh, um, possible for people to unmute themselves how, how did you how did you yeah. set it up? Okay, so let's keep uh, this fairly open. Um, where if folks want to ask questions or chime in as I'm going through the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself. But just for the benefit of other folks who um, you know don't want to hear background noise, mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, okay, give me a sec. Oh, I ruined the joke by putting it up first. Okay, so. Um, can you guys see the presentation, Java Clients and Java Effects, the definitive guide? Yes. Yes. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is, of course, Java Effects technology. But I think um, we're doing this all virtually. And I don't know about you guys, but when the 
the virus outbreak started and there was a global pandemic um, taking over the world, this this is kind of how I, I pictured myself during the apocalypse. Um, so of course you need you need your trusty dog sidekick. Um, probably you're scavenging for food because the world's gone completely to, you know, kind of kind of like like a terrible place to be. And um, unfortunately, none of us ended up actually doing anything cool like this. Um, instead, this this is how the pandemic I think looked for most of us. So this <laughs> this is my my home setup, um, and I have multiple monitors. I have a camera set up. I have a, a an obnoxiously large microphone, so you guys get good audio quality. And um, most of my day is is coding, writing books, or, or on Zoom calls. So I think that's that's become life as the normal but i guess it's it's kind of a good thing for us because um we're fortunate in the software development industry that we we can work from home we we don't have to show up in a physical place and this this makes it a lot more possible to get job opportunities to work and to also give um, virtual presentations on technologies like job effects now as i was mentioning i i've been doing job effects for a long time actually longer than I thought because I was doing it back in the 1.0, so that puts me back 12 years of job effects. Now I'm, now I'm really dating myself. So we, we were talking about this before we joined, but the, the LJC has a 14 year history. Is that right, Barry? That's right. Yeah, okay. So you, you're not that far off from the, the inception of Java FX because the original F3 release was in 2006. That was when um, Chris Oliver created form follows function when he was working at um oh what's the name of that company web web oh i can't remember um they get acquired by sun so he he came in through an acquisition and he had this cool technology called form follows function which was built on piccolo 2d which was a, a java zooming 2d framework which i was one of the open source contributors of um, the java effects release came out in 2008 um, that was the initial release in 2011. Um, JavaFX script was removed, but it actually made JavaFX better because it was more accessible to a wider audience and you can now use JVM languages with it. It was bundled with the JDK in 2012, JavaFX 2.2, and that was a big milestone because now everybody had JavaFX and then it was fully integrated with the JDK in 2014. Um, unfortunately, in, in 2018, um, Oracle decided to to push the the big red delete button, um, which is unfortunate. But like any good community effort, the entire JavaFX stack was open sourced. You can't you can't keep a good community down. I'll be back. Okay, so like like any good um, um, iconic movie hero, um, JavaFX was was here to stay, and um, we we were able to get all of the source code for JavaFX and for JavaFX Mobile to be open sourced. Um, so this meant companies like Gluon, who um, does basically mobile APIs for JavaFX, um, to be able to support it. Um, continue to develop Java effects on mobile devices like iOS and Android, which we'll talk about. Um, they also support Scene Builder, which is the best way to get started with Java effects and to learn it. And um, also um, support all of the latest builds of Java effects on um, JDK 11, of course, JDK 8, but also 11, 12, 13, and 14. So you can run Java effects on the very, very latest um, JDK builds, which are coming out. Um, so if you're <clears throat> watching this presentation, you don't need to take notes. Um, all of the slides are posted at um, the show notes page on jfrog.com slash show notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that includes today's slides, a video of the talk, which we'll link back to um, the LJC's posting of the Zoom recording. Um, and we also have a raffle going on, on the site, so you can win a Nintendo Switch raffle. And we have five t-shirts exclusive for LJC members as well. Um, and I think if, if like me, you, you have kids at home, um, one of the best ways to keep them entertained is, is actually the Nintendo Switch. It's, it's awesome for this purpose. Um, 
Okay, and there's also a bit.ly link there as well, which you can do. So the first thing which we're gonna showcase is Scene Builder. And I think if you're new to JavaFX or if you've just never used Scene Builder before, this is really the best way to get started with JavaFX technology. Um, it's a visual scene builder tool. It was developed originally by the Oracle team in France. Um, there, I can't remember the town they're, they're in. Oh, Grenoble. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the it's the team under Sun, which was located in Grenoble. And they did a really nice job both with the, the user interface. So it makes it very easy to do drag and drop construction of UIs. But also there's a beautiful abstraction of the... Um, um, the code and all of the um, um, UI code. So you can um, directly, uh, just a sec here, let me share a scene builder while I'm talking. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see scene builder now. Um, so one of the nice things about scene builder is it, it separates your code from the UI definition file. The UI definition is XML, your code is in a controller. So this way you can modify the, the design and you can round trip it. So you can directly modify the XML, bring it back into the editor and it's, it's very easy to edit. So um, on the left side here, you have the different elements. So control containers, this shows all the different um, container types which you can do to nest elements. Um, controls, so these are all the different controls which are available in JavaFX, which basically is everything you need to build any sort of modern UI. Um, Gluon has some of their mobile widgets here. Um, there's also menu controls, shapes, charts. So a lot of different capabilities you can get just by browsing um, the interface. So we'll just randomly stick in a, a border pane and um, let's do maybe a text widget. Maybe let's do it. Let's do a let's do a web view. Why not? Put a web view in the center. Um, so when you drag things here, you can see that um, this bottom one gives you kind of a view of the different elements. And then on the right is the inspector. So you can change the elements um, inside of it. So I think probably somewhere in the web view, we can actually set um, what page it's going to show, I would hope. Let's see, do I actually have to write code to use this? And I probably have to write code to use the web view because there's not a direct URL property. All right, not the web view. Let's just use a, let's just use an image instead. Uh, uh, we'll do the image view. And then we'll stick a menu on top. Oh, menu bar. That's great. Maybe I need to stick a menu control. Yeah, here's the menu bar control. Okay, now we have a menu on top and let's do a list view on the left. Okay, so just a quick mocked up user interface and then like the image one is easy to change the properties of. So we can directly select an image off our hard drive, so. Let's choose the JFrog Dr. Strange t-shirt. And um, there's a preview in Scene Builder where you can directly run the application. And this, this isn't just a sample preview, it actually runs it in JavaFX. So you can see the, the actual user interface is active and any buttons or menus or widgets will work. Obviously they're, they're not wired up to the back ends. So it makes it very easy to, to mock up and create quick user interfaces. Um, now, let me just show you the code for this quickly in IntelliJ. Um, I'm not sharing right now, but I will in a sec. Once I find my desktop folder where I dumped that. Here we go. And... What did I call it? I called it sample, maybe? Ah, sample. Okay, let's reshare. I think. Okay, so um, here, here's an example of what the actual um, UI, which we created, looks. 
And so here's the, the border pane. Um, here's the menu bar we put in it and you can see the, the elements for the file edit and help menu inside of it. Um, here's the image view with a reference to the, um, um, the image which we put inside of it. And if you make any changes to this, it'll directly modify the scene builder user interface. So it's completely round triple. You can modify this, you can hook it up with a controller and it makes it nice to do that designer developer um, workflow. Okay, so you should be seeing the slides again, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so some examples of JavaFX applications, which um, are kind of used in the industry. Um, this one is um, for Mint software systems and they do basically um, a flight um, error program for kind of scheduling different folks. Um, you know, obviously this, this is probably not getting as much use as it was before when airlines were getting a lot more business, but it gives you an idea of the sort of complex user interface with like um, Gantt charts or tree tables or other complex controls, which would be otherwise be relatively hard to create from scratch. Um, another example of this is, um, this is a project from NASA the NASA Deep Space Trajectory Explorer, which um, the folks at NASA were nice enough to let us use imagery of. And basically what they do is they calculate the, the trajectory of celestial bodies using some scientific libraries. They visualize it using the Java 3D libraries, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit and show you some guys some demos of. Um, and this um, is a nice melding between um, the fact that they already have Java libraries, which they wanna leverage, and then they can showcase and visualize it in an entirely Java application um, with extremely high performance. So this is great for any complicated user interface, which otherwise would be very difficult to create. Um, and it's also great for mobile applications. So here is one example of a mobile application, which is the um, DevOx and Vox um, app for iOS and Android. Um, you guys might have used this if you've been to any of the DevOps or Vox conferences, and um, you'd have no idea that it was written in JavaFX because it gets packaged up just as a native application. It's responsive, it has good performance, and um, from an end user perspective, you don't, you don't need to install Java, it just bundles the runtime components and everything you need to, to leverage Java. So you may already be using some Java mobile applications, some JavaFX mobile applications, and not know it. Um, a great example of a mobile application which is a lot of fun is Garrett Grunwald built a a space effects game which um, is a lot of fun so um, let me let me show you guys what this looks like hold on da, da, da. not that not that oh here we go Okay, so here's the, the GitHub project for the site, um, Space Effects, which um, Hans Soller or Garrett Grunewald did. Um, so it's, it's an awesome little space shooter. It, it runs on um, iOS, so you can use the Gluon mobile framework to, to run it on your Android device. It runs on desktop, and it also runs on JPro, um, which is a framework for using Java in the browser. And um, this is a really cool way where you can actually to run reasonably performant Java applications. And all of the processing is done on the back end, and then it sends back the um, image data to the front end, which is all done in JavaScript and runs entirely um, in, um, inside the browser with no modification. Hold on, you guys probably don't okay. So um, now you can see my, my awesome retro game skills. Okay, so um, it's basically a, a space shooter. Um, all the stuff is animated in JavaFX technology with, with sprites. Um, Garrett has a nice gaming library for building games like this, which you can do. There's your shield. I'm going to get crash into rocks and stuff. Supposedly there's a rocket that I can fire. Um, yeah, no, it is. Okay. 
Okay, so you get the idea. Um, but it's it's a cool example of what you can do with um, JavaFX technology very quickly and easily um, to build both complex business UIs and also build um, mobile applications and build fun games. So hopefully you're now interested to to do a little bit more JavaFX. Um, I'm just going to cover a few kind of different areas which are, I find interesting. And um, of course, um, these are all examples from the book. So you can check out our JavaFX book for more details on any of this stuff. But one of the most, one of the APIs which was added in most recently to JavaFX was the 3D APIs. And um, it actually has quite good capabilities, but it's fairly simplistic and easy to understand compared to like doing OpenGL or something. So I think it's a nice introduction to doing 3D and you can fully integrate it with your regular application. And you have some predefined shapes like boxes and cylinders and spheres. Um, you can of course do user defined shapes as well if you wanna import them from 3D programs. And to get more complex, um, user interfaces, what you typically do is you would do texture mapping on top of these shapes. So this is an example of a UV map to map the globe, like kind of a world texture onto a, onto a globe model. And you also can do nice things with um, lighting. So it gives you default light source, but then you can set up point lights and ambient lights. And of course use um, it, uh, use these to illuminate the scene, give different colors, and um, kind of create create a more visual world. And there's also a bunch of um, third-party libraries like FXYZ, which allow you to do more complicated 3D modeling in code. And this is an example of an open source library, which um, the folks at, at NASA quite use. So um, I'm gonna show you some code examples now. Let me share um, IntelliJ, hold on. Let's start with the Earth Sphere one. Uh, okay, so you guys should be seeing the, my IDE. Um, how's the, the font size? Is it, is it readable for folks on the stream? Okay for me, I'm on a tablet as well. Okay, awesome. Um, so this is a simple example <clears throat> of creating a, a sphere, which <clears throat> is not very complicated. You can see the, the code here is just new sphere. It's a library. You give it the, um, <clears throat> the radius of the sphere. And then it's um, using an image here, this Mercator image. And this is a standard Mercator projection of the world. Um, and then it creates a a new material out of this, um, sets it as diffuse map and then applies it to the, um, to the sphere. And there's some additional code here for transformations. <clears throat> so if we click, we can rotate it by dragging on the sphere, which is kind of nice. Um, and let's see, oh, some point lights as well, just for lighting and some cameras. So like not, not much code, this whole file is under a hundred lines. And um, let me run it quickly and show you guys the output. So here, here you can see the output of running this application and it, it um, now looks like a proper sphere because it does a Mercator style projection over the globe. And we also have the, um, the mouse pointers so you can um, rotate the globe slowly. And let's see, you guys are all, well, I can't go up and down, but you know, now, now you can see where you live, maybe. It's a little tiny. Um, yeah, so really simple example of what you can do with JavaFX. Let me find a second example of, let's do a light, light example. Okay, light demo. Okay, so here, here's a really simple example of um, how you can use lighting and I'm gonna, do the opposite, I'm gonna run this first and then I'll explain the code because I think that's a little bit easier to, um, to understand. So this, this is what the application does. Um, so it has two light sources, a red light and a blue light. And then you can move the position of the red light and the position of the blue light um, around the sphere. So now, you know, the, the blue light's about here, the red light's over here, and they're, they're now illuminating exactly one face of the cube. 
Now, if I if I overlap the two, let's see if I can get this working. Now, now you can see that both lights are illuminating the same surface, and now we're getting purple because the lights are are blending together. And this is just a quick example of of the effect that lights have on your overall scene. Um, let me see if I can somehow get it to, to all three faces. No, I can't. This is my, my 3D spatial sense is not that great, but all right, there we go. Now it's a different red and blue face. Now, if we look at the actual code, which is driving this, um, again, it's, it's a fairly um, simple set of code for the light demo. Um, it creates a new scene, and then um, <clears throat> we're using a technique called binding in JavaFX. So you can create properties which um, have values which can be bound to. So this is kind of a class wrapper around um, doubles and other primitive types. Um, and then when in the code, what we can do is we can do um, a technique called binding where we take the property we bind it to another property, which is a property on the control. And whenever you, you change the, for example, the, um, the slider, where's the slider binding? So here's the slider is bound to the property. The, um, the light is also bound to the property. So that way, when you, when you move the slider, it automatically updates the light position. And all this is kept um, bidirectionally synced up for you because it's using a, a bidirectional binding. So if you update the um, positional light, the control will update. If you update the control, the positional light updates. So this is kind of a, a nice programming paradigm which avoids a lot of event handlers. If you had to do this with just pure event handlers, you'd have a lot of like um, inner classes or lambdas, which would basically be not doing a lot of interesting logic other than just whenever the value is changing, updating another value. Um, so that's nice. You can see all the um, sliders are added to the scene and um, they're put inside of a border pane, and then finally the slider. But again, it's about 150 lines of code for this example. So um, a relatively small amount of code, which lets you do a fairly complex scene. Um, okay, and the last 3D sample, actually this isn't even a 3D sample, but I wanna show you something else cool graphically, which I think is, is fun to learn about, which is um, particle systems. So, in, in general, the, um, the system for doing graphics in JavaFX is primarily based around um, vector graphics and a, a scene graph of elements which is composed for you. So this is, this is very handy in general, but it, it does suffer from introducing a layer of overhead which makes it harder to do high performance, low level graphics. So um, one of the nice things in JavaFX is it gives you a construct called Canvas, which lets you directly draw each of the frames, kind of like the old um, draw method in Java 2D, where you'd, you'd get invoked each time through the draw cycle and you could draw whatever you wanted to on screen. Um, and by, by using the Canvas, you can create extremely um, efficient and complex systems. And this is an example of an implementation of emitters and a particle system built up on top of the, the canvas control in JavaFX. And um, so I'll run it so you can see what it looks like. All right, so here's the particle system application. Um, so whenever you click, it's creating a little particle system in place in the locations we click. Um, we can choose the, the number of particles. So more or fewer particles the particle duration, the longer the particles go, the, the more they spread out, right? And the particle size, you can make them tinier or larger. Um, opacity, um, change the color. Let's do, let's do some nice green. And also the background color, which, which you know, you can set to whatever you want to, but that's, that's not a great compliment for green. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing too well on my color choices here, but you can see like it's, it's a, it's a lot of fun to play around with this. Um, so you can create some pretty cool visual effects um, with particle systems. Um, I think that this is one of the higher performance things you can do in Java effects. Um, I, I believe Garrett's, Garrett's um, game probably also uses 
heavy use of canvas as well for some of the visual effects because that really gives you the best low level performance. And one of the nice things in general is JavaFX will take advantage of your um, acceleration, your hardware acceleration um, on your computer. So you get the best performance possible um, given your computer processing capabilities. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, 3D, but I think one of, I, I wanna kind of lay out some of the key tenets of modern application development in JavaFX. And I think this is, this has changed over time where it, it used to be um, quite normal for folks to ship fat jars of your application um, to really only think in terms of desktop, like client installs and um, to, to not really take advantage of the cloud and different things which have uh, modernized development. And I think when you're looking at um, modern application developments in JavaFX, there's kind of three tenants which really matter. And the first one is to package your platform together with your application. Um, and this is counterintuitive because usually people are trying to keep their application sizes smaller, but that actually doesn't matter. So um, in general, applications keep getting larger and larger. So these are some of the top mobile applications and the size of them, how it's grown between 2013 and 2017. And um, in, in general, the devices have more memory, you have more available storage, and really having an application which is works and is well tested with the platform is much more important than keeping your application size small. And um, Java, Java in general and JavaFX keeps making this easier. So it's not recommended to use a fat jar, which basically is packaging up all your classes, but then expending them to have the right JDK on their system. That rarely works. Um, a good alternative to that is um, JLink, which uses the new modularity feature that was released in Java 9, packages up your application with the required modules and gives you the smallest possible um, application executable. There's a new tool called JPackage which will package up modular and non-modular applications with the required JDK. And that's actually the easiest way to package your JavaFX applications. And um, there's some new options available um, using Graal where you can create native applications. This allows you to run on devices like um, iOS, which won't allow you to use a just-in-time compiler or to recompile code on the fly due to sandbox restrictions. So this allows you to get around that and also it improves the startup time significantly. Applications which are pre-compiled using Graal's ahead of time compilation start up almost instantly, which is unusual for Java applications. And they also, um, in general, all the um, optimizations are done in advance. So you don't have the normal hotspot bootstrapping startup time where you get slow performance starts. Um, and there's also a new project called Open Web Start from Karakun, which will let you use Web Start from the um, browser and they're fully supporting that. And of course, JPro, which I showed earlier for the, um, the example application of um, the um, uh, little Starfield game. And the way of looking at how you create your images is you take your Java application, your dependencies as inputs. Um, you would give it the, um, the Java SDK and the JavaFX SDK, which you want to compile against. And this is nice because you can exactly target the version of the JDK and test against the version of the JDK, which you want to use. Um, Graal VM can do native image ahead of time compilation, which is very nice. It improves startup time. It allows you to run on more device types. And Gluon Mobile has some device access APIs if you want to access the accelerometer or other things from mobile. And this will give you, as an output, binaries which run on Windows, Linux, and Mac, um, native images, for mobile and native images for embedded. And the nice thing is that um, from your end user perspective, even if they don't have Java installed, it will just work like a native application. So you can deploy it to um, stores for um, the Apple store, um, the Windows store, the, the Play store and Android devices. And um, your application just is available and works like any other desktop application. The, the second kind of, I think big, mindset shift is to, to think about targeting mobile first. And um, this is something which has evolved over time, but if you look at the amount of usage of traffic on websites, um, mobile since 2018, 
mobile has overtaken desktop in terms of the amount of traffic that people are putting on your average website. And it's pretty amazing because if you, if you remember, um, you know, just a, just a decade ago, um, mobile data was quite expensive and it was hard to get like very fast, high traffic devices. And, um, and now it's the norm. In a lot of countries, people have mobile devices and they don't even have desktops. Um, so it's, it's kind of become the starting place for consumers um, where they start with mobile first. And it's also from a design standpoint, it's much easier to build a mobile UI because they're usually simpler and then adapt that to a desktop application later. If you do the opposite, if you try to cram desktop application features into mobile, typically it doesn't work as well. Um, for JavaFX on mobile, as I mentioned, use the native image support from Graal. Um, you can use any version of OpenJDK from 11 onward up to the late, very latest version. So um, Gluon's been doing a good job of keeping up with the latest releases. Um, it runs on Mac OS, Linux, iOS, and, and Android. You get Gradle and Maven plugins. Um, there's nice IDE support for IntelliJ Eclipse and NetBeans for quick starts. And um, there's, a, there's a link there to a um, getting started with some client samples from Gluon if you want to quickly um, build some mobile applications and, and test it out yourself. But it's, it's super easy. Install the plugin, um, set up your project. If you're on um, Macintosh, you also need um, is it to develop for iOS, you need to be on Macintosh and you need to have Xcode installed because it uses the Xcode command line tools. Um, Android, you can do on Mac or Windows. Um, if you really want to do um, Apple applications on Windows, you could do it inside of a VM if you don't have access to a, a Mac machine. And um, you can quickly create um, great mobile applications um, just using your basic Java skills and the JavaFX APIs. Okay, and the last kind of overall tenet I think is important is building for the cloud. And if you think about this historically, it was very common to store data in like, you know, property files or like local databases, um, not really do backend integration. And this is one of the reasons why web apps have gained a lot of popularity is because they're by, by design, you have to store all your data on the back end on the web server. You don't really have local storage options. Well, you do have local storage options, but you have to, you have to think about and code for them. It's not the default. And um, for interactive applications, this, this really is a game changer because now all of your data is online. And an example of this for a JavaFX application is um, ETO board, which um, is an application that lets you synchronize your sprints and your scrum timelines on nice large um, touch screens with all this data synchronized with REST APIs back to a common backend. So this, this is an example of how you want to architect and build your applications rather than designing it for local use, design first for the cloud with a, a backend. And there's lots of good applications, lots of good libraries you can use to, to do the backend integration. Um, the simplest is just to use um, a JSON parser, um, send data back and forth using REST, and you can quickly build applications which consume data from existing services like this weather example we're gonna do. Um, and also um, you can um, do stuff um, with building your own REST backends for more complicated um, multi-user interfaces. So um, to start with, I'm gonna, um, show you this application, which is a weather application, but I need somebody in the chat to think about a city which they'd like us to use for the application. So just pick either the city you live in or the favorite, well, I guess I know where you guys live, <laughs> or your favorite, your favorite location, and um, we'll use that as the use case for the weather application. All right, so you should be seeing the the code window for the weather application. Um, let's see. Ah, in chat, we've got we've got folks who want to see. I'm going to pick the first one, Manchester, from Peter Hicks. Where where is where is Mumba? Is that Mumbai or is that like a different city which I'm just not familiar with? Oh, Mumbai. Okay. All right. Um, maybe we'll do that one next. That's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Okay. So basically this, this code base has one main class, the weather app, 
and it, it goes back and it uses a, um, a backend weather service, open weather map, um, make some rest calls against that. So we just have to put the city we want in here. So we'll do, we'll do Manchester. Did, was there really a slash N in there before? No, there wasn't. It's interesting. It, IntelliJ is being smart and putting in slash Ns for carriage returns it catches. Um, and it basically, it just, it just goes and calls the, the um, Jackson API for doing um, a rest call. Um, where's the actual code? So here's the object mapper. Oh yeah, the rest URL. Then it's reading the values and then updating the model. And in the update model, it will set an image based on the image. It'll pull back the, um, the temperature. I think it returns it in Kelvin. So this converts Kelvin to Celsius. So we probably get this in Celsius. Although no, it says, yeah, yeah, Celsius. Um, and then we also get the humidity from the APIs as well. So let's, let's give this a try. Uh, I had the wrong action selected. Let's run, not deploy. Okay, so the weather in Manchester is cloudy. 20.9 degrees Celsius, 64% community. So so what do you think, Peter? Is that fairly accurate? Peter, Peter and Helen were both live in Manchester, I guess. Okay, sounds good. Um, and of course, we said we'd do Mumbai, so we're definitely going to do Mumbai. Um, I lost my I lost my Zoom share, but just give me a sec. Okay. And Mumbai looks like it's hazy. Twenty-eight point three three Celsius, ninety-four percent humidity. So. Um, is that, is that pretty, is that pretty accurate? Um, awesome. How, how do you say it? Hrish, Hrishikesh? Hrishikesh. Um, so awesome. So now we know the weather in Manchester. We know the weather in um, Mumbai. And um, you can see that it's not a lot of code to, um, to, to write this. And um, it's something which probably a lot of you are familiar with for just building REST backends. So um, something else we're gonna do since, since we have the code here um, as well is um, we're going to publish it to Artifactory. I, I work for JFrog now and I used to do DevOps stuff before I joined Oracle. Um, and we used, we used Artifactory back then because it was the best package management system. Um, so I just dumped our package library into Artifactory. And then let me let me find my browser. Okay, we're gonna switch over here and take a look at course. So I'm using the the free tier of JFrog. We just launched this two days ago, and apparently it works because I was able to deploy and get stuff building. Um, this, this gives you a free quota every month. So you can basically use our products for free without signing up. And, um, here, here are the builds I'm deploying for the weather app. So let's see, eight, 18, 11, 45. Yeah. Yeah. So that looks like the build I just pushed in. Uh oh. So, okay. So you can see here the x-ray status. It does security scanning. I have some security issues. Um, and Okay, so I'm, here's my weather app and here's the um, Jackson library using for data binding. I'm using Jackson 298. And this contains a flaw with polymorphic deserialization of Melissa's objects. And an uh, somebody could use this to execute arbitrary code. And then here's the, the bug report against it. So Usually the arbitration, the way of fixing things like this is you upgrade to the latest version of APIs. And you see here, they have the fixed versions. Um, so 298, looks like 2910 fixes the issue if I, if I upgrade to Jackson 2910. Um, let's, let's see what the latest version of Jackson core is. 
Uh, oh, they're already up to 2.11.2. So let's, <clears throat> let's just do the upgrade now and then redeploy. Uh, um, that's inside of this configuration for my build. And uh, let's do 2.11.2. And then we'll um, republish the artifact. And I guess we should also test that it runs too, I guess. Um, and yeah, so the app, the app's still working on the latest version of the Jackson APIs. Um, and hopefully this also solves the security issue, which we saw. Um, and I, I unshared my browser again. Where's the browser? Come on, Zoom. Ah, here we go. Okay, so here's our builds. Let's go back and, and pull the latest build again. Okay, so this is the very latest version. Um, you can see it scans no issues. And um, if we look at the published modules, we, we can see, uh, let's see, maybe the environment's what I'm looking for. Okay, but anyway, we can see that we've we've now resolved the security issue. Um, so that was a quick example of um, how you can do things in the cloud <clears throat> um, with the weather application. So it's a fairly simple API. <clears throat> we ran the ran it. We did it for a couple cities. We also fixed our code so we don't have any more security vulnerabilities in the code. Um, all of this stuff is from the book, um, which was written by all of these great folks. Um, and there's a huge community around JavaFX technology, um, lots of great people who are involved in it. And um, this presentation actually was helped prepare with help from Johan Voss and Jose Pereira, the first two folks in the list here. Um, and they're also the folks, some of the folks behind Gluon and committers to um, OpenJDK. And speaking of, Open JDK, um, probably the best way to influence the roadmap is to help contribute back. Um, so all of the JavaFX code is um, part of the OpenJFX project, which is also a subproject under OpenJDK. The project leads are Kevin Rushforth, who um, is a great guy. He historically has um, done client stuff back in the days of Swing and then helped make JavaFX a reality. And Johan Voss who um, is um, the CEO of Gluon and also contributing a lot back to the JavaFX ecosystem. It's all open source, there's clear development rules, you can be a reviewer, you can be a committer, and um, you can get started with more information about how to run JavaFX applications at openjfx.io. Um, as I mentioned, um, all this is from the book, The Definitive Guide of Modern Java Clients with JavaFX, which we recently released. So um, that's a great reference for this and also more information about how to get started with JavaFX applications. Um, this whole presentation is available online. Um, if you go to that QR code or bit.ly link that you see on the screen and you get a chance to sign up for a switch with two games. Um, and we're gonna give five of the Iron Frog shirts, which is our our latest JFrog t-shirt to members of LJC. So um, we'll, we'll do a drawing and five folks from the audience here will get a, we'll get a t-shirt. Um, and with that, I wanna open it up for any Q and A. So um, what, what do you guys want to hear about or what questions do you have about JavaFX technology? And um, feel free to, either you can ask it in chat or you can unmute yourself and just um, shout it down in the stream. So whatever you're more comfortable with, um, either should work fine. Hi, um, I've got a question about uh, sort of parallel builds and packaging. 
Um, when I was playing with this before, I found that lots of different versions of uh, JavaFX tend to change the API and also are only compatible with very specific versions of Java. So getting a parallel build pipeline set up to support multiple different versions of Java was very, very hard because the actual API chain, you know, there isn't sort of minor version releases. Every one is a major version change. So you end up needing lots of parallel branches. Is, is there any way to, that you would suggest to improve that? Or is it just not a good idea to do parallel builds? Or, you know, how do you handle that? Yeah, so um, I, I guess... Uh, Okay, so so that that's true that the JavaFX version is always tied to a Java release, and it's with the new release cadence, um, you you do really need to update your JavaFX version every six months to to be compatible with the latest JDK, because um, that's when the any breaking API changes happen, and um, when new JavaFX releases happen shortly thereafter. In general, the recommendation is to use um, the latest version of JavaFX and the JDK, which goes along with it, um, or the latest maintenance release. So if you want to stay on maintenance releases, use Java 11 and um, JavaFX 11. But in general, it's safe to use like Java JDK 14 and JavaFX 14. Um, and then package the version of Java with your application that you're using. So you use the JPackager so that the end user doesn't have to worry about what version of Java they're running. They just run your application against the version of the JDK, which you've tested against. Um, but I'm curious, what's your, what's your use case for parallel build pipelines to get multiple, multiple JavaFX versions of the same app? Uh, in my case, it was just, I've got a little open source uh, Zookeeper editor thing, which lets you muck around in Zookeeper. Um, so obviously I wanted to keep updating and especially when new versions of Java come out, you know, I want to upgrade it so that you can yeah, use yeah. the latest version of Java. But in doing so, you then run into the problem of when you're adding new features, you only add new features to people that want the very latest, potentially buggy version of Java, unless you actually develop on two separate parallel branches and backport all of the changes, which, you know, for large open source projects is maybe fine, but for little small ones, not so much. So I wanted to do several versions, especially because there's also a sort of it's not, I guess, directly relevant to JavaFX, but it gives a connected problem of um, I have a CLI mode as well for that little app. Um, so, you know, you can use it in GUI mode or CLI mode, which I see, I see. that is awkward if you're doing the native packaging. So I do do the native packaging for people that want to do the, um, you know, the, GU the GUI, but for when you want to do a little bit yeah, of command Yeah, but you still need to magic, provide the... the yeah, know, I'm not magic. sure about how well that would really work with, you know, can you get a package just native binary that includes all of Java? Is that sane? And even if it is... Um, it's still yeah. Great, I, I think you if you're if you're doing backport. command line stuff, you probably want to be running against the JDK that you have installed, um, yeah. and you're probably a more advanced user anyway. Um, in, in general, the, the the advice when we switched over to the um, um, the the six month release model was for open source projects to release on both current Open JDK. And also last um, LTS JDK. Hmm. Um, and the, the reason for that is um, you want to be able to, some people want to be able to take advantage of new features. And obviously you, you have to be testing on the latest features to know there's a problem with the next LTS. So if you're keeping up, you, you're kind of helping the JDK grow. But some projects can't move that quickly and they need a more stable, slower moving target, which is what the LTS releases provide. So um, I don't know about your particular use case, but like typically that combination covers 90%. And um, there's some projects which also need to maintain Java 8 builds because folks still can't get through modularity and they're stuck on JDK 8 for whatever reason. Cool. Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, and I'm, if you have any other like details around that, I'm happy to follow up offline just, you know, Hit me up on Twitter at Steve on Java. Sure, I might do that. I do have another question, but um, you should let other people jump in first. Yeah, let me answer some of the questions from chat. So one person was wondering how JavaFX works with mobile native APIs like cameras and GPUs. So um, Gluon added 
um, APIs for the accelerometer, for the camera, for the GPS. So they have JavaFX specific APIs. And I think when you're doing on desktop, it basically they have like a no op provider, which, you know, if, if it's not available on desktop, then it, then it, it, um, it just hides it. So your application doesn't break. Um, so you can use all those capabilities from JavaFX on mobile, just like you with the native application. Um, and the next question is what the current state of support for JavaFX on Raspberry Pi, and does that include the web view? So um, I, I actually wrote a book on this for Java on Raspberry Pi. Um, at the time, <laughs> it's, I'm dating myself, this was JDK 8, um, and that was also the version the Raspberry Pi Foundation was shipping together. Um, with the Raspberry Pi. Um, Gluon maintains embedded Raspberry Pi builds as well, which they, they update for the latest versions. So um, I, I, I've i done this for JDK 9 and 10, I think. I haven't done it past that, but I, I believe there's now releases for LTS releases for 11 and 14. But if you use the Gluon embedded builds, those are the latest version and it includes a bunch of fixes for touch screens, um, for um, doing things in X windows and other stuff, which uh, weren't included in the original release for Java 8. So I definitely recommend getting the latest glue on embedded builds. Um, I, I can't remember if I tried doing a web view in there or not. So the, the question about web view will, I assume means you tried it and it doesn't work, but I don't know why it wouldn't work. Actually, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure we were using web views for something in one of our embedded demos. So I don't know. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> we have to test it. Um, okay. And any other questions on um, on voice that people want to ask? Um, How do you test um, your UI side of things. I did look into testing JavaFX stuff and it's a nightmare. There's like one library and it doesn't work properly. <laughs> At least that's what I found. Yeah, so uh, there there is a testing library for JavaFX, which um, frankly, I I haven't used. So I, if, if you're telling me it doesn't work great, I, I trust you. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe it hasn't been updated. Um, for a lot of user interface work, what you can do is you can separate um, kind of the backend controller from the front end UI widgets. Um, so I think if you're not doing end to end acceptance testing, if you're just doing unit testing, that's a more sane approach. Um, so it, and, it, can, it can be interesting because yeah. there's a couple of things that don't quite work that well. One of them is you want to test that when you click on things that the right sort of things happen, especially when you've got, like you were showing off before, all the bindings. Um, but in particular, mm -hmm. there are things that when you have the more complicated components that are doing a lot for you, you don't always necessarily understand what they're doing internally. So in my case, I had a, uh, a, a one of the tree views, and the, the tree view does something slightly counterintuitive when you scroll, in that it tries to re-render absolutely everything. So because I was doing effectively a query to an external service, for everything I see. rather than doing it once every time you scrolled a single pixel it would actually redo the query now that's the sort of thing that you could easily nice. pick up with the test but it actually took me forever and a day to work out just you know breakpointing it yeah so um i mean i i know there's there's ui frameworks which will literally click the screen for you and go through it that way um to a certain extent, you can call event handlers directly if you want to do some simple test automation. But I, I think, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know a particular easy JavaFX-ish way to, to click through UIs and do testing of them. I guess uh, contribu contributions welcome though, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, I think, it, I think it's something which probably would, could use a good open source effort to improve. But, the only other the other thing that I run into, which is quite um, problem causing, well, that's good grammar, isn't it? Um, is in terms of trying to get the I mentioned I had a command line version of the thing. Um, the command line version obviously wants to be able to run on servers. And the interesting part is that JavaFX apps don't seem to like uh, starting up on a server that doesn't have X installed on it, which uh, of course headless. most servers yeah, won't. Headless. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so do you have any uh, advice on basically getting, you know, a multi-mode app like that to both allow you to have a lovely JavaFX side and also a, a command line side without, you know, breaking everything horrendously? Yeah, so um, some some of the like like if you if you start the JavaFX application through the normal application um, start starting point, that's probably problematic. But you should be able to create an alternative start point through a a main method. Yeah, which if you use the alternative, avoids actually creating the user interface. If you use the main, it still seems to find it. I assume because it's trying to find, uh, just trying to resolve the components or something in the class loader. I never actually worked it out, but uh, I was sort of wondering whether I could separate the whole thing out with modules or something like that and avoid it loading, but it's, it's quite awkward. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it depends on how much of your application logic is tied to the UI controls and the binding, which is hard to separate versus how much of it is logic that you could just call from behind the scenes and never I, I think you're right like once you instantiate your your core JavaFX application then that that starts the process there's a whole bunch of ui magic which happens behind the scenes and that probably is not going to work on a headless system um yeah so i it's I don't have a good solution for that other than re-architecting your application to separate the non-GUI stuff out so you could call it entirely separately. That would, But that might be a lot of work depending upon how your application is structured. It's not that bad in context, but, you know, it's a, gen a more general question, you know, for these sorts of things. Yeah, so yeah, no, it would possible. be nice to have a way where it, it would run on headless systems, but just without the user interface, right? So yeah. it, it basically a no-op on headless systems, I think, is what you want. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm... I'm but I've seen some of the stack it. traces when you start your application, and the stuff it's doing would be hard to... without modifying the core. Like, I mean, I, I think you could make an open JFX contribution, which would allow for that, and fix that problem if you were okay hacking the source. Um, but I think it would be a fairly invasive hack. Yeah. I mean, my solution was just install X on the servers, but I don't think that's uh, necessarily <laughs> a, uh, a, a good general solution. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not. Um, especially if other folks are deploying your open source application. It's yeah. hard to tell them that you need X running on your servers. Okay. Cool. No, those are really good questions. Um, Okay, let me let me double check chat and see how we're doing. And um, Barry or uh, Will Will has some response. Um, Web view JavaScript page it failed testing on the Pi. Yeah, so so actually, Will, what I'd recommend is um, this would be a good question for Johan from Gluon because um, he's been maintaining the embedded port. So um, either message me on Twitter or I'll be happy to hook you up with, um, with um, Johan and he can directly answer if they have any plans to improve the, the web view support. Um, okay, so I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Um, anything which you wanna say in closing for the LJC folks? Uh, no, I'd just like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot about Java effects and uh, I'm sure everybody else did as well. Uh, so again, uh, there's lots more events happening virtually with the LJC, so feel free to uh, keep in touch and uh, join into our future events. Thank you very much. Cool, and thanks very much for coming. Um, I appreciate the, the questions and the interaction. You guys um, clearly know your stuff, um, as I would expect from the one the Java community. And the next opportunity for me to physically be out there, I would love to uh, present in person because um, it'd be great to be back out in London. So thank you guys.